everyone. Uh, welcome to my talk. So today we're going to talk about um, open table formats as well as some of the um, updates in the Apache Iceberg community. First of all, um, a little bit more about myself. Um, my name is Rafi Yao. I'm engineer and product manager here at Google Cloud. I've been here at Google a little over four years. Before that, I've been working in a series of big data companies throughout my career. So, so today's agenda, uh, first of all, we're going to introduce what are table formats. Um, and then we're going to talk about the, a few of the available uh, ones. Um, they can get access on top of GCP. Um, then we're going to deep dive into a little bit about Iceberg. And then uh, we're going to introduce some of the, the most updated uh, features that I've been working on in the community. So first of all, what is the table format? A table format is a way to organize data files um, into you know, form a, a structured table. Um, so the most typical um, file format you can think of is actually Apache Hive. Um, it used to be the only way that organize um, data into a data lake or an enterprise data warehouse on top of Hadoop. Um, but it has some you know, inefficiencies. So we're going to talk about that first. So on the left is a high-level architecture for a Hive, um, where client access to a Hive server, which is actually the front end that handling the Hive queries and change these queries into a you know, logical plan and physical plan, et cetera, et cetera. Um, on the left side, there is a uh, Hive Metastore. So basically all the table metadata, such as partitions and data file locations, um, statistic all stored in Hive Metastore. Um, it's actually backed by a relational database. On the right side, all these actual data files are organized into a tree-like tree -like structure and put into um, the storage system. So we used to be most of these are uh, running on how HDFS. Um, you know, nowadays, a lot of the Hadoop cluster are actually running on top of uh, cloud and uh, the storage system being the cloud storage um, usually you see an object storage type of uh, systems. On the right side, it's a typical um, structure of a Hive table. So in this case, I put it on top of HDFS. Um, you will see a slash user, slash Hive, slash warehouse. And then under that, there's a, a database, um, DB123. Under that directory, there's table. Under that, will be partitions. Under that will be data files. So this this whole design poses a few issues, um, especially when it comes to the cloud storage um, type of world today. So first of all, the structure um, is actually a work against the recommendation um, on most of the object stores. Because, uh, for example, we organize data into a year, um, then the months, then a date kind of partition. Um, if we want to access all the data within, say, 2020, 2020 um, there are going to be a lot of requests that go into the same prefix, which could cause hot spotting on object storage. Um, on top of that, there's a lot of uh, listing operations to get all these partitions and find all these data that's stored in, inside of each partitions. Um, there's no, not really a transactional support before Hive Asset. But even Hive Asset is introduced, um, it actually uses the same kind of a data uh, directory structures. Second point is isolations. Um, one of the annoying problems that with Hive is that um, you know, a reader can read the data while um, you wouldn't know there's a writer is actually writing to that table or appending data or partitions to that table. So your read state could be unknown. Um, it's also common practice for adding or dropping partitions on HDFS uh, to a Hive table, um, which actually breaks that atomicity and also breaks table statistics. Um, breaking that table statistics will cause um, inaccurately um, calculating the query plan, which causes um, performance and scalability issues as well. As we talked about earlier, um, listing operations on object store is slow. Um, but Hive actually needs to owe n level of uh, listing calls, where n equals the number of partitions. Um, and Hive also needs to open a lot of, let's say if you were using parquet files, it actually needs to open a lot of parquet files underneath that partition. 
um, to find your data, which is kind of a slow on the object storage as well. Um, some there's some, a lot of other problems. For example, large tables could accumulate huge amount of metadata in itself. It's actually hard to parse. Uh, so there are other issues uh, for Hive. Uh, we talk about the table statistics. Another kind of common pain point is the physical layout. Um, so where uh, uh, we construct the table, let's say by partitioning uh, by day and hours, um, if that user doesn't know the physical layout of, of that table, um, the user could very well be um, passing the where filter you know, by a timestamp where in this case actually results into a full table scan. Um, some other issues that Hive doesn't support, things like lineage, um, history, and the uh, schema evolution type of um, requirements. So now we talk about Hive. So let's look at what the trend is happening um, in the data lake world. So um, as data storage become cheaper and cheaper, people are thinking like, hey, maybe we can use some of the uh, database kind of technologies and database features inside of a data lake. Um, so these will be typically like a data quality ask. Um, data lake used to be treated as a raw storage for a lot of companies. So the user will put into unprocessed data, so not so high quality um, data gets put into the data lake. Then when you retrieve that, you have to clean it up. Um, so that slows down all these processes of gaining insights out of the data lake. Um, another part is the, we talk about the, the transaction and isolation. Um, there are other requests around data management, especially like a, um, things like schema evolution, data lineage, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a couple of um, table formats that are available on top of GCP. Um, we actually ship Delta Lake. Uh, we support Apache Iceberg as well as Apache Hootie. But today we're going to mostly focus on um, Delta Lake and, and Iceberg. As you can see through comparison, um, these two storage uh, table formats pretty much have more similarity than differences. Um, there are, of course, other um, angles they can compare, um, but all of them support really um, asset transactions, uh, schema evolution. Um, it's a you know, structured data format. Um, you can roll back to history, look up history. You can do time travel access. So let's take a look at Delta Lake, how did it actually achieve all these characteristics. Um, Delta Lake uses transaction log to, to achieve these features. Basically, transaction log is uh, kind of similar to Red Hat logs, where all the change, um, change operations come to be queued and write to the log first. So this gives you a couple benefits. Um, the first of all is being the single source to choose. So the log become um, this like a truth where um, all the views that derive from this log are consistent. Um, so the user won't get a fork of content. Um, it also guarantees anonymity. So um, inserts operation, updates operations are either complete or not complete. So be not complete being not inside the transaction log. So there's no intermediate unknown state. So in the diagram below, um, kind of give you a simple illustration how this happens. So in the first commit, um, the operations that we did um, add a bunch of data. Um, you know that data results into one and two dot parquet files, and they are being committed into um, a commit file called one dot json. And in the next batch of operation, we remove all of these data. We add some more. So we remove one and two parquet files, and we added a new uh, three dot parquet. And that results into another commit files. So when the iceberg um, to get the current state of that data, which we'll is pretty much goes through this process, um, replay all these commit logs, and and you can later roll back. Uh, you can look up history, you can look at lineage, and even evolve the schema. So here's the structure um, how it looks like on the storage system of a delta table. Um, there are two main parts in each of the table. There's this data part, there's actually a transaction log part. Um, the data part is shown above, um, where it has the partitions and, and data. Uh, of course, partitions are optional. 
So as we talked about earlier, so on the transaction log, there's a lot of commit files. As you can see, all these JSON files. So each commit will create a new commit file. When there are many commit files, uh, Delta will then create the checkpoint files, which is the example in the below. Um, a checkpoint file really represents that state of that table. So as you can see, think it is pretty much like rolled everything before that into one checkpoint file. Um, checkpoint file can be, um, you know, a, a great way to achieve, um, to increase the efficiencies to look up. So you can just look it up to carry, to calculate the current state of the table. You can just look up the, the most recent, uh, checkpoint files. Um, you could or may or may not have a few more commits after that point. Um, but if you do, you pretty much just, uh, get the latest checkpoint file and replay all the commit files happen later than that. Um, and you can also track data that uh, no longer being used. So for example, I don't care any data that uh, being written or hasn't changed like uh, 30 days ago. I can purge those data as well as the metadata associated with it. So now let's look at another uh, really interesting project, which is Apache Iceberg. So uh, let me start on the top of this structure. Um, so Iceberg also provide assay transaction. So let's take a look at first um, how to actually achieve that. And then we can look into some other characteristics as to how it's actually being so efficient um, to handle the table schema and some of the partition nuances. So on the top, you, where you have a reader and have a writer. So the reader is reading, the writer is writing to a new, pro, new place. So Ice, um, Iceberg uses this concept called snapshots um, where there's also a current snapshot pointer, uh, which in this case is actually a pointer snapshot two, where that reader is reading. And while the writer is creating the next new snapshot, when they finish, it will switch the, the pointer to the new one. So there's a, some benefits to this kind of design is that there's no need to lock the whole storage system in order to uh, do a write. So um, where readers can continue to read from the current snapshot, consistently without any of the new data uh, that is happening in the next snapshot. Um, and you can, you know, all these changes to, uh, to the data files and stuff is, um, is atomic. So basically pending cross partitions, merge and rewrites, these are, these are all atomic operations. Um, Iceberg added a lot of the table schema, uh, partition layout, statistics into its metadata. Um, all the metadata, are immutable. So the history is linearly moving forward. Um, current snapshot, there's basically, that's a pointer, uh, it says two, that can be rolled back to one. Um, if in some future days that is point is three, you can always roll back to a previous state. So next we're talking about how to commit. So when the writer finished writing to say snapshot three, um, it'll find the base version, which is snapshot two, um, creates all these new metadata and manifest files, which we're going to talk next. Um, then we're just going to atomically swap the base version pointer to snapshot three. Now snapshots are, are split into multiple manifest files. Um, and each of the manifest, sorry, manifest list files, each of the manifest list files, then will split into man multiple manifest files. And the manifest files actually stores the um, pointer to like, data files and some, some statistics. Um, these manifest files are being reused to from from different manifest lists and um, and different snapshots to avoid the you know high volume rewrite. Um, we'll come to that later. So let's look at the the content of these metadata. Um, so on the on the right side, this part. Um, is the manifest list file. Um, so as you can see there, it contains manifest file passes, um, lengths and partition, lower boundaries, upper boundaries. Um, the bottom part is actually showing when I'm open up a manifest file. Um, it has the data file location format, as well as some of the iceberg tracking data. Uh, there are values to filter files for scanning. For example, there are partition like data uh, data volumes, values um, per column, lower and upper bounds. Um, there are 
metrics for cost-based optimizations. So on the file level, these are row counts and file sizes. Uh, on the column level, there are value counts, the number of null values, as well as the size um, of that column. So these are very, very exciting um, characteristics that we just talked about for Apache Iceberg. So now, um, you know, how to get it started um, if you want to run on top of GCP. So Apache Iceberg actually supports a two way of putting your data and table. So one way is uh, rely on the storage system. So you can use something like a, a Google Cloud Storage or HDFS. Another way to store these metadata is actually inside of a a hive meta store. So uh, very conveniently on GCP, there's a data proc meta store, which is a managed um, hive meta store. So after we created that, we basically get a, um, a, a thrift IP address and a port. So we can use that to connect iceberg to um, our data proc meta store. So this is the way you kind of start with the, um, use the uh, Spark SQL to connect. And you can pretty much create table. And as long as you spec specify using Iceberg, um, then you pretty much your table is already being structured uh, by Iceberg. So where you can insert values and query that. So next, um, these are some of the examples um, that I can show uh, some of the Iceberg metadata access. So in the first query, we basically just uh, query all the snapshots uh, that is stored inside of this table. And we can look up histories, and we can also look up manifest files. From the talk about, um, I pretty much introduced you to the iceberg concept and how to achieve some of the um, asset properties um, and some of the other characteristics. So now, as Apache Iceberg getting adopted more and more, um, the community is coming together and adding more features. So the top one is the merge into support. Um, so now you can do upserts and merge data or even delete data into your table uh, based on another source table. Um, we can practice this um, in the, the some their, their example on the Iceberg website, you can try it. Um, second is to support uh, copy on write and merge on read. These are the different ways to support write um, to Iceberg. So the copy on write is a way to optimize for reading. Um, so basically, it creates an entire copy of the data um, every time you write it. But it's, as you can kind of uh, get it from the intuition, it's a little bit slower on writing, but it's optimized for reading. Uh, merge on read is the other way. So where each of the write creates a delta file until some point um, you merge these status into um, a full version of the data that is ready for uh, ready to be read. So this is really optimized for writing uh, where the reading part is, could be a little slower. <clears throat> next point, next feature is uh, SQL extensions in Spark 3. Um, so basically this supports um, creating procedures. There are, are there are many uh, like building procedures in Iceberg already uh, for mostly management purpose. For example, you can roll back snapshots, set the current snapshots, um, expire some snapshots, remove some of the orphan files, or even rewrite the manifest files. Um, there are also some procedures support migrating Hive or Spark tables into the Iceberg format. Next is, um, as we can kind of show a little bit earlier, um, the support for Hive catalogs uh, loading Iceberg tables, in addition to just the Spark session uh, kind of a catalog. Um, the next one, um, is still in progress. Is the the version two of the iceberg format? Uh, basically, the intention is to uh, support role level deletions. So with that, um, that kind of concludes my talk today. Um, thank you so much for 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 listening. And um, my name is Dr. Yao. Uh, feel free to reach out to me there. And um, with that have a nice day.